Hello, and welcome to our final episode of Everyday Explorers. I'm Robbie Newell. And I'm Brendan Sample. In this show, we're going to take a look at two local staples, Love Park's Christmas Village and a local arts center where we took the $20 challenge. We'll then show you what happened when we sent our crew to the juice room to find some hidden treats. After that, we'll quiz you and some students around LaSalle's campus on social media, help you create a seasonal household with some self-made decorations, and show you how a local student produces music from his own room. I'll also be sitting down with Chris Berry to discuss his involvement in LaSalle's Theatre Club. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's talk about one of those local staples. Good idea, Brendan. Every year just before Thanksgiving, Love Park is transformed into a Christmas village. Modeled after the European holiday markets, the Christmas village is full of interesting shops, food, and people. Let's check it out. I'm Alfred Lewis, down here at Christmas Village, located at Love Park, one of Philly's classy destinations. Take a look. Across from City Hall and the brand new Rothman Ice Rink, Love Park's Christmas season is in full swing. Christmas Village has become an absolute staple in Center City for residents and tourists alike. With countless vendors setting up shop and showing off their wares, it really captures the essence of the traditional German markets. Despite the stress of trying to find last second gifts or losing toddlers in lines, there is plenty of seasonal cheer to go around. Even among vendors, there is a camaraderie that keeps them coming back every year. I think just everyone's attitude and personality uh, visiting the booth. Typically when they come into the market, they're excited to be celebrating the holiday. So you rarely find anyone that's in a bad mood. It really does have to be this season. Walking around the village, there are vendors with a little bit of everything. Horse and buggy rides, homemade ornaments, delicious baked goods, and of course, the humongous annual Christmas tree. It really gets you in the holiday spirit, but I think Alfred got a little too into it trying to sneak a peek at Santa. For a lot of people who are not from Philadelphia, Christmas Village is a brand new experience that they might not expect. Not every city has something like this. It's um, really exciting. I didn't know this was a thing. With the smell of <laughs> gingerbread, bratwurst, and mulled wine, it really is a special place to be. And even more surprising are the relationships that the vendors create with each other and their customers. You know, we've been in the same spot for six years, so we know everybody around us. You know, people who come from, you know, uh, Russia, Egypt, you know, all over Germany. And, you know, it's just a great common bond that we all share. And, uh, you know, we keep in touch throughout the year, too. And even though it opens the weekend before Thanksgiving, it manages to stay packed until just after Christmas. So Alfred got to cap off his visit to Christmas Village with the most important thing of all, a blessing from Philly Jesus. For the crew of Everyday Explorers, we want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Oh, 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 oh. And that does it for me here at Christmas Village. I had a great time. I got a nice Irish hat, a nice cup of steaming mall wine. If you're around during the Christmas season, I suggest you come down and check it out. Back to you guys at the desk. That looked like a lot of fun. I'm not too sure about the mulled wine, though. Neither, but I do like Alfred's hat. I did, too. Heading away from Love Park, our next segment takes us to South Street and the Philadelphia Magic Gardens, a local art center full of different kinds of modern art. Let's see how our fellow explorer, Corey Meredith, did when she took the $20 challenge. accessible by subway. General admission is $7, but with a student ID, the cost is only $5. Tickets allow for access through the garden for the entire day. Spanning half a block, the museum offers an immersive outdoor art installation and indoor galleries made of all non-traditional materials. Isaiah Zagger created the space with found objects, such as bicycle wheels, colorful glass bottles, handmade tiles, and more. Zagger's life, family, community, and wider world art and history influenced his beautiful creation. Philadelphia's Magic Garden is a unique landmark that is fun and educational for its thousands of visitors each year. Leaving the Magic Garden, I continued down South Street to check out some of the many shops. The array of shops is sure to satisfy any type of style and taste. I checked out the Vintage Boutique and saw dozens of options for Christmas sweaters. And of course, Starbucks can be found on the block as well. South Street was all decorated for the holidays. 
But before my challenge came to an end, I had to stop at Lorenzo and Sons to grab a slice of pizza. I got my huge pizza from Lorenzo's. Now I'm ready to head home and leave South Street for the $20 challenge in Everyday Explorers. I'm Corey Meredith. That place sure has some interesting art, and I'd love a slice of pizza from Lorenzo's right now. What do you think, Brendan? Yeah, it does have some great works, and the pizza looked amazing. But all of this exploring is making me thirsty. Well, lucky for you, in our next segment, Hidden Treats, we sent fellow explorer Amanda Keaton to the Juice Room. It's a great local juice bar that's perfect for doing homework and hang hanging out with friends while sipping on some delicious smoothies and juices. Let's check it out. Hey everyone, I'm here in front of the Juice Room on Germantown Ave. I want to go talk to the owner and also try a smoothie for myself. Let's go inside. When you walk inside the Juice Room, your attention is first captured by the decor. The Juice Room has a style of its own, mixing different colors and textures, the new with the old, and east and west. I guess it's just my style. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sort of all over the place. Um, I'm a, I was a painting major in school, so some of the artwork is mine. Other things, it's just, they're things that I love, you know. I, I, I appreciate color, I appreciate, you know, things from different countries. After noticing the decor, your nose is taken over by the rich smell of fresh fruits and veggies. You can't help but feel good and healthy when you walk in. Well, I wanted to have a healthy option, first and foremost. Um, you know, it's really difficult when you're going out to find something that's actually healthy. And different vegetables all have just different, you know, nutritional benefits. Like beets, for instance, they're very good at cleansing the liver and the kidneys. Green juices in general are, are detoxing for the system. It's not a replacement for food or anything like that, but it's like a nutritional supplement, essentially, but a natural one. It's like a healthy feeling. I feel good drinking it. Like, I would go to Fit Life. Um, I haven't in a while, but um, earlier this year I would work out and then I would come here and it would just feel really good. Well, a lot of people will come in and they'll do a smoothie first because they get a little nervous with the whole, you know, vegetable thing. As a first time customer, I was a little nervous about the vegetable thing and decided to order a fruit smoothie. Uh, there's lots of options for a first timer, but I would say a soul rise smoothie is a good one that's mango, banana, strawberry, and um, yogurt, or a green smoothie, of course, which is still good. Che Che Cole, which is peanut butter and uh, Nutella and banana. The reason that we actually started was back in 2008, my mother was uh, diagnosed with cancer, stage four. And uh, so it's doing a lot of research on nutrition and something that could help her, you know. And juicing was just a part of that. And so we chose a nutritional, um, you know, protocol to use. And I started juicing at home, juicing with family. And, you know, it just seemed like a nice fit, you know, something that I could like actually benefit people and, you know. I got the Morning Rush smoothie with granola, strawberry, blueberry, and honey, and it tastes delicious. For Everyday Explorers, I'm Amanda Keaton. Now, how come no one brought me back a smoothie? Oh, well, I guess I'll just have to go to the juice room during my free time. We can go together after we wrap up here if you want. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. Well, that wraps up our Exploring Philadelphia portion of the show, but don't change the channel just yet. After a short break, we'll be exploring the life and knowledge of the students at LaSalle. Hello and welcome back to Everyday Explorers. In the first half of the show, you saw how our crew explored Philadelphia. In our next segment, Getting Schooled, my fellow host here went out and tested the knowledge of LaSalle students on social media facts. How'd it go, Brendan? Pretty good. There were some people who knew the answers, but we did manage to stump a few of them. Say, Robbie, do you know when Facebook introduced the like button? I don't, actually. When did they introduce it? Well, you have to watch and find out in this segment, Getting Schooled. 
and this installment of Getting Schooled, we caught up with members of LaSalle's communication department to test their social media knowledge. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg created the site while attending what Ivy League college? Hold on, can I send this tweet first? I know this one. Harvard. Harvard? Harvard? Uh, Stanford. The correct answer is Harvard. Gada! Ding! What is the significance of the video, Me at the Zoo? Is it A, the millionth video uploaded on YouTube? B, the first video uploaded on YouTube? C, the first video to go viral through YouTube? Or D, the name of the first ad placed on YouTube? The first video on YouTube. Third one. I have no idea. It's always just guess C. Um, I'm gonna guess it's the first one to went viral. The correct answer is B, the first video uploaded on YouTube. No, it's the first video uploaded to YouTube. <laughs> it was the first video uploaded to YouTube. Well, what was it about? It's a guy in the zoo. Guy in the zoo. <laughs> Next, what year did Facebook introduce the like button? 2002. 2008? 2004? Yeah, 2011. In the grand old year of 1968. The answer is 2009. Oh, that's good to know. Oh, gosh. What social media site did Yahoo pay $1.1 billion to own? MySpace? MySpace. MySpace? MySpace? Is it Tumblr? The correct answer is Tumblr. Are you kidding me? Because nobody knows what happened to my city. For our last question, what is the most liked Facebook page that is not Facebook related? Is it Pinterest? Something to do with sports. Shakira? Of uh, the Pastafarian uh, fan page? The correct answer is Shakira. There you go! Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> Well, that does it for this segment of Getting Schooled. Be sure to brush up on your trivia, because you never know when you may be next in Getting Schooled. Back to you guys at the station. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, see, you can't put this out there. Wow, some of those questions are actually pretty tough. I thought the like button was a part of Facebook since the day it was founded. Yeah, it was really fun to try to stump a few of my fellow explorers with some random knowledge. I'm glad you enjoyed it. With the holiday season just around the corner, what better way to get into the spirit of holidays than some homemade decorations? Our fellow explorers Dan Russo, Tom McIntyre, and Zach Ranitsky will show us how to get into the holiday spirit by decorating a house in our next segment, Self Made. Dan Russo here with LaSalle TV. Everyday Explorers, we're going to be doing some homemade decorations with our Self Made segment. We're going to meet the boys inside, we're going to do some decorating all together. Let's go have some fun. Let's go see it. Here is Zach Reninsky and Tom McIntyre over here. Zach's going to start us off with some cardboard decoration tips over here, so let's get right to it. Let's do it. All right, well, I'm Zach Reninsky. I'm here today to show you guys what I'm going to call the cardboard paper chain, and it's going to involve a lot of circles. I have these cut up slices of uh, cardboard paper, I skipped the first step, which would actually just to be take the cardboard paper and you know slice it up into these shapes. So here's how we're gonna get started. You're gonna take this cardboard paper, make it into like a circle shape, okay? And then you're gonna take a stapler and you are going to staple this slice of cardboard paper together so that the circle stays. Thanks a lot there, Zach. Your finished product sure looks great. Next, as we're sipping on some hot cocoa, Zach is folding his paper and cutting triangles out of it to create a design to be hung on the wall, while I'm tracing star designs on my festive paper. Now our next homemade decoration is going to involve duct tape, thread, and some North Philly pine cones. What you're gonna do is take this thread, put it through the pine comb, put it across your fireplace, and duct tape the edges. And now look how beautiful this set is. So, Tommy fell asleep, as you can see. Zach's gonna take a break, so I'm gonna hang up his paper chain link 
over on my mantle over here, which is a great spot because Zach did such a great job on this. Now I'm just gonna hang it over. Homemade decorations. So that will do it for our self-made segment here. For myself, Zach, and Tommy over here, we hopefully you guys learned a lot about some homemade decorations and we're gonna send it back to the studio, right back to you guys, all right? Those are some really nice self-made decorations. I'm going to have to get those guys to come over and teach me how to make some of those self-made decorations for the holidays. Well, while we're on the topic of self-made, fellow Everyday Explorer Jake Smolinski gave us a look at how he creates music just out of his bedroom. Take a look. So my name is Jake Smolinski and I am the manager of Lips Records, uh, which is based out of Buffalo in a dorm room in Philadelphia. It is a little DIY label that just kind of does everything for free, run cassettes, merch, we do our, everything ourselves. Our roster is made up of number one, the Cascos were number one, uh, then the Organelles, which was just a two-man garage rock group that I had with my friend Kevin, then um, tagging on after that was Poles, which was another punk thing. Then it went to Local Onlys, Shelly the Cat, Wiley Something, and Falcon Cat. Oh, and Helmsley. Helmsley's another one. Working with all these different bands, like the one thing that I've really tried to stress is how to make something sound as natural, how to get the most organic sort of sound out of every instrument. And the best thing is like with my setup and all the different equipment that I've been able to kind of just find, everything has its own unique sound that I, whenever I'm like with like other people who um, they, you know do home recording and everything, they're always like, how do you get the sound like that? And I was like, oh, well, it's just my keyboard run through my Vox amp, run through another pedal. And it's just like, you start to figure out ways to make your stuff sound completely different than like the rest of the pack. My idea is just like, why not actually get good at the basics? Like learn how to set up all this stuff, learn how to like operate everything. And hey, like I've figured out how to make my crappy stuff sound good. And from there, I've been able to build up my own personal studio that has a lot of different personality than a lot of other different sort of style studios. I'd rather just have somebody listen to it and have kind of free access to it. Um, that's kind of my opinion on the music business right now. You might as well just get it out to the masses. I'm not doing it for any sort of profit. I'm just doing it because I enjoy doing it. It's so cool that there are people who can produce music like that right out of their dorm. You can download Jake's music from lipsrecords.bandcamp.com or Lips Records on SoundCloud. Well, that brings us to another break, but don't go anywhere. When we return, Brenna will be sitting down with Chris Berry to talk about theater here at LaSalle. Stay tuned. Life is hard. Effective consent is simple. 
Do not make hookup decisions if you won't remember them. For more information on sexual assault, visit nomore.org. Welcome back to Everyday Explorers. Sitting with me now is Chris Berry, and we're going to talk about LaSalle's theater club, The Mask. Chris, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So uh, before we, uh, to start off, can you just tell me a little bit about The Mask, uh, what, what the club is all about, and a little bit about your position there yeah. as well? Um, the Mask is a th student-run uh, theater organization on campus. It's been around since around 1929. Um, it, we do two shows a year with a what we do a spring show in the uh my fault we do a musical in the fall and then a straight show in the spring and then we have a in between that time we have a thing called the mavericks where we do that students who are interested in writing plays and performing and stuff like that their own plays but not committing to a whole show we let them submit their own plays in one act and try out and see like if they have what it takes to be able to put on a show for just for fun and have a good time mm -hmm. And then with my position in the mask, I'm the vice president of technical affairs for it, which means I'm in charge of all things, stage crew, tech, making sure the, run, the show runs properly, um, making sure the set is safe, make sure the lights are hung, sound's going well, music's on time, anything like that. Um, and with my position as vice president of technical affairs, it means I'm also the president of the Technical Theater Association, which basically just means everything with stage crew and everything like that. Okay. Well, you mentioned 1929. That's certainly yeah. a, a long time to, it is. Uh, to be around. Uh, has yes. that been consecutive? Yep. Um, we've never been, like, ne there hasn't ever been a year where we didn't make a show or anything like that. Um, actually, in the beginning, a uh, bunch of our beginning time of the uh, organization, mm -hmm. we actually would show about, like, four or five shows a year, and, mm -hmm. and that would include during the summer as well. And, there were, and the mask used to be something that was a lot bigger throughout the city and stuff like that at the time as well. Oh, yeah, that sounds awesome. Uh, so uh, from four or five shows down mm -hmm. to two, now has that been, has it been like that uh, ever since you've been with, uh, with the mask, having a, mm -hmm. a musical and then kind of a regular play? Yeah, um, ever since I joined about three years ago, um, it's always been a musical in the fall and then a straight show in the spring. And then, like I said before, in between, we also would have Mavericks which would um, allow students to kind of do like a free, a fun show that kind of just loosens everything. And we accept all kinds of applications for that, whether it's musical, straight show, comedy, drama, anything like that as well. Very nice. Yeah, I have seen some of those Mavericks and yeah. they've definitely been uh, pretty entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, how does the mask uh, pick what kind of shows to do? Um, the general membership of the mask is able to, to submit any play that they want to, want to be able to see or perform mm -hmm. on stage. And then when those plays get submitted and they get submitted to the e-board of the mask, which would include myself and I believe four or five other members, I can't remember off the top of my head. And we would sit down, review everything, see what's feasible for us to be able to put on, whether it's like not enough actor spots or something like that. Say if it's a play that has like three main leads and then only like one or two ensemble pieces, yeah. we're probably not gonna put it on because that's gonna take away a lot of general actors and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And likewise for tech, if a show's too grand, too grand to be able to put on tech-wise, whether it's just money not being there or whether it's just limitations for the theater, then we'll kind of kick it out. But if it's all good and we like what it stands for, we'll submit it. We'll hold on to it, and then we'll put it up for general um, election by the general membership of the mask, and then that's how they get selected. Mm, very nice. Yeah, and it seems to go very well uh, with the, all the plays each semester. Mm, thank you. Now, uh, since you oversee all the stage crew aspects of it, mm. what exactly is it that uh, stage crew does uh, during a regular show? Yeah. Um, it depends on the show. Like for the last one we put on, which was, um, I'm actually blanking on it right now. I'm. Okay, um, so we, what we did was we put on the show, we, for tech, we would go in every, almost every night at seven o'clock into the theater. We'd either, if it's carpentry, they'll start building the bases of whatever needs to be built, whether it's um, frames that needs to be built, walls, floors, um, bracings, anything like that, whether it's like this last show, we had to do a boat, so we built a boat. Um, we had to do a boat wheel, we did a mass, we did a bunch of different things. So carpentry does that, lighting hangs the lights, um, where they would bring down the fly systems, hang them up, whether it's controlled from up in the cats or whether it's down on the stage. And then sound comes in and hooks up mics, hang it, 
they hang mugs from the um, fly systems normally as well for the musicals, um, just to be able to hear everything. And then also they get like lavaliers onto the actors during the musicals to be able to help them project their voices when they're singing. Um, we don't do that much so much for the um, straight show because there's no singing really necessary as much, so they're able to talk and project easier. So they don't really need the lavaliers attached to them, so we just have the hanging mics to help project a little bit instead. Uh, that certainly sounds like a, a lot of a lot it, of detail, a lot of effort to go yes. into just one show. Yeah, it's a lot of tiny parts yeah. coming together. Yeah. Uh, well, in the midst of all this, uh, I imagine craziness, uh, and not <laughs> not even imagine. I've heard this from uh, other people. Uh, amidst all this, what do you like most about being in the mask? Uh, what I like most would be honestly the the family aspect of it. Um, nowhere on campus have I been able to see like a actual family aspect where. Um, we're in the mask. We, when we go through everything, when we get, um, when we actually join it, we get paired with someone to kind of mentor, get close to, and actually enjoy uh, being around. And they kind of take us under their wings, and then we get to know them. We get to know the mask. Get to know um, every aspect of it. Like we, so we having a nice little family aspect where we get close to the people in there, and we all know that. If, when it comes down to it, we all we are always there for each other instead of like fighting about. Yeah, we all have little fights, but we're all there for each other though. In the end, yeah, that certainly sounds great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you, Chris, for uh, being on the show. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly helped us uh, learned a lot about uh, the mask. It was great to hear about all of that. Thank you. Well, that is going to do it for this final episode of Everyday Explorers. Make sure to follow us out TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also check out our YouTube channel for all the latest episodes of our shows, or any you may have missed. For Robbie and the entire crew, thank you for tuning in. I'm Brendan Sample, and this has been Everyday Explorers. Thanks for watching, and remember, never stop exploring.